Thank you very much. I enjoy the environment. This is very nice. Um, now, I wonder how I got tricked into ministering on Christmas. Uh, never been a passion of mine, never been. Uh, so, um, I am not a traditionalist. Not called of God to be. You may be. I'll support you. So, this message this morning will come from an angle you probably haven't heard. And uh, I'm really excited to bring it to you. Uh, my heart is full, and I, I want you to know as well that um, I had said previously a couple weeks ago that I was going to speak today on sonship and walking in covenant with God. Uh, however, due to the Lord twisting my arm, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to do that. So I'm going to speak to you today on, you know, God's fatherhood. God's fatherhood. This is a Christmas message. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you ready for a Christmas message? Okay, and I'd like to, uh, this morning to greet uh, all of our wonderful members at United with Christ in Panama City. Thank you for joining us this morning. Bless you guys. Can't wait to be with you. January 13th is the plan. And uh, so we're making a plan to be there then. Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, Sorry I can't be there to see you in person, uh, but we'll look forward to a, a few weeks from now to be with you. Uh, also, um, today, you know, is like a family day for us. Um, I don't know about you, but I mean, I know every single person up here in the choir, and I felt love. <laughs> I felt joy and, and gratefulness for each one of you. Each one of you is so amazing. Thank you for what you did. Thank you. And the kids, Margie, that was, the snowballs was fantastic. <laughs> you know, Margie is out of the box, right? And, you know, she can turn it around, twist it around, make it different. She will. And I just appreciate, I'm going to help eat those pumpkin pies. <laughs> there are pumpkin pies. Someone already took one. <laughs> There's five there. Wasn't there six pumpkin Who's got the pie? <laughs> um, the kids are precious watching what they did and, and all of you adults singing. It's really so tremendous to be a part of a genuine loving family of God. So it's kind of what the, the message is sort of about today. And so to start off, I just want to bring this one thought to you to kind of start us down that road. You know, a lot of people talk about the incarnation, and the incarnation is stated to be God becoming flesh. I think a more accurate way of saying it is that it, the incarnation, it's all about God the Father. You know, it's all about Him joining His DNA to humanity. Okay, so it's genuinely from Him, the seed, being joined to humanity. Now, this is a part of Christmas that I think gets lost, and we have to see it. Otherwise, people are not going to understand why we celebrate the birth of Jesus so significantly like we do. And, and I think, if you just think this one thought, Jesus' birth is a manifestation of everything God has in mind for you. It's not just about him. It's about you. It's about every single one of us that God wants to birth his spirit and his nature inside of humanity. He wants what he birthed in Jesus to become what lives and vibrantly moves inside of our lives. He wants the same thing that raised Jesus up to be the thing that raises you up to become all you can be. The thing that made Jesus special if I said to you, what was the thing that made Jesus special? His Father is what made him special. What was special about Jesus? Was it miracles? What was special about Jesus? Wasn't the fact that he was clever or could outwit all the religious people of the day? What was special about Jesus is that he carried 
the substance of his father. He carried the spirit and the logos, word of God, the intelligence of God in him. He was word and spirit in human body. And therefore, God joined himself to humanity and manifested his life and nature inside of human flesh. And I, I noticed something that really is very, very exciting. You should think about this. That it wasn't a struggle. When humanity was joined to God in Christ, there was no conflict. Humanity is not wicked. Humanity is not sinful. Humanity is the plan of God. You were authored by God. You were not authored by sin. You were not authored by wickedness. You were not, off, you were not authored by some human evolution. God made humanity for his indwelling. This, this morning while I was worshiping, it just like came to me like during, during the choir singing. And Jesus was on his way into Jerusalem and he says, I tell you the truth, if, if these people, because the religious people were saying, Jesus, you got to simmer the people down. The throngs of people were, was worshiping and falling down and honoring Jesus. He says, I tell you the truth, if they don't worship, these stones are going to cry out. And I always wondered, why would the stones cry out? But I realized that the temple was built of the stones, and the temple was carrying the glory of God. And he's saying, the glory, my glory, is going to move from a stone building into the people. You know you're not, you are the temple of God. And so don't let stones cry out in your place. You know, this thing gets personal. I met a guy the other day, and he, I said, how you doing? And uh, nice to see you. And he, he says, where do I know you from? I said, well, I'm a pastor and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, right, yeah, I knew you from that. And he goes, I only go to church on Christmas, so that's good. We, we want people to come to church on Christmas. We want to. And, but I want you to know, God didn't come to bring us a service. He didn't come to bring us religion. He didn't come to bring us traditions. He didn't come to give us a holiday. He came to give us life. And he had to start this amazing, miraculous intervention into humanity by bringing his spirit and nature into a man. And by bringing a man on the earth to represent him in his life, Jesus became the author of life. Jesus is a forerunner. He's not the only one. It says that he is the only begotten son of God. But I want you to know, when that was said, he was the only begotten Son of God. Now it says we've all become sons through Jesus Christ. So he's the firstborn among many brethren. That means the people who were with him, they also received the life and the nature and the Spirit of God. See, this is not about a, a religious culture. It's about a spirit of family, a life. And so I want you to take a look at a few scriptures that might help you see it. If you can go to Luke in the book of Luke, chapter 1, I told you I'm not very traditional. <laughs> it's just the way I'm wired. Luke, chapter 1, verse 67. It says, uh, now his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So this is about the birth of um, John the Baptist. Um, it's pretty amazing stuff. Now his father, the father Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to prophesy. Now remember, Zechariah was mute and dumb. He, could, uh, he, he couldn't speak. His mouth was stopped because God says, I want to give you a son in his old age. And he goes, how is this going to happen? And God struck his tongue. And so for a long time, his tongue was silenced, and yet his wife Elizabeth was pregnant with a baby, and Elizabeth was carrying the baby, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was carrying the child of God. And it says when Mary came to see Elizabeth, it says in her greeting, she says hello, it says that the baby inside of the womb of Elizabeth, John the Baptist, leaped and was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that's powerful. So I would suggest that babies are important in the womb. 
Enough said about that. <laughs> the, the power of God was already on the baby, so much so, he had spoken one word, didn't do one miracle, didn't do one great thing. He was carrying the DNA of his father, and he was carrying the Spirit of God within him. And when he greeted, the mother of him greeted Elizabeth, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. Now, is it any wonder that John the Baptist grew up to become some great, amazing person who was going to transform his society? Because the purpose of God is formed from the womb. It should be. It's powerful, right? So, remember, Zechariah, his father of John the Baptist, he, he wouldn't accept it. So God took his voice. So then the day the child is born... They, the mother said his name will be called John. And the Bible says his name can't be John. He has no relatives called John. They would name people after their relatives. And she says his name will be John. So they said they turned to his father, Zechariah, and says, what will you call him? And they gave him a writing implement, and he wrote John. And as he wrote John, they were stunned, and his mouth was opened, and he was right here filled with the Holy Spirit because he began to cooperate with God. Every one of us has a day where we lay our rebellion down and start to cooperate with God. And in that day, God's Spirit will come into you and begin to transform your life. It happened to me many years ago, and I can tell you something right now. You couldn't trust me before. Hide your stuff, hide your women, hide everything because this guy is after his own desires. I had a good outside shell faking it, but inside was a bunch of problems. But I remember the day I bowed my knees like Zechariah to the will of God, and the Spirit of God came upon me and changed something inside of me. I didn't know what I got in that day, and that's what we're talking about today. And so, so Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. What did he say? Blessed is the Lord our God. Now this is about the introduction of Jesus Christ. Remember, we all talk about Jesus, but we need to talk about more about the Father who sent Jesus. Right? Yeah. Blessed be the, the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies. You should be saved from your enemies. Did you know that? Jesus came to save us from our enemies. And from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to redeem his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. And you, <laughs> child, let's talk about John, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will, be, you will go before his face, the face of the Lord, to prepare his way. To give knowledge of salvation to his people. God is not just interested in you just saying a prayer. He wants us to understand and have knowledge of his salvation. To his people by the remission of their sins. Remission means pardon or deliverance. To be set at liberty. That means he broke the bondage of sin so that we could be set free from it through the tender mercies of God which with which the day spring or in the Greek day spring means the rising of light from on high has visited us so this visited us in the Greek is to exercise oversight Jesus didn't come just to visit us he came to exercise oversight of his people's movement through the earth, of, of instilling his word and his nature in the earth. Did you know that? Jesus is exercising oversight. To give light to those who are in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide or direct our feet in the way or the journey of peace. Peace means to be set at one again. So when you come to peace, it means that you and God have been reconciled. And your sins have been removed out of the way. And he's reconciled all men to himself. So the reconciliation is a legal thing that God achieved through Jesus Christ. Jesus' coming was about you. 
It wasn't so we could bow down and worship him. We do that. But it was about him coming to liberate people from the bondage that they were in. He's called a deliverer or a savior of the world. That means he came to do something about the problem that we had so that we could be liberated to become everything that God had in mind for us, which looks a whole lot like Jesus. Okay, so it means to be brought at peace or be brought at one again. I want you to know God wants to be at one again with you. He wants you and him to merge. He wants you to come to peace so that you'll not fear. Anybody who's intelligent in the word of God, anybody who's obedient to God, anybody who loves God, anybody who's in relationship with God is not fearful about the future. But if you're still toiling in the flesh, if you're still going according to human ideas, if you're still striving and struggling, if you're still trying to be a religious person, which means you're trying to be good enough to make it, you've already failed. Because it's not about being good or bad or being Santa Claus's buddy. <laughs> Who's naughty or nice? Do you want me to sing? I'll, I'll give an altar call. <laughs> no, <I'm> just... <laughs> It's not about that. These are all metaphors which are off course. God did not come to make you a better person. He came to transform you into a new one. He came to give you a new heart and a new mind to know and to love God. Ask me how I know. How's a rascal? I mean, I don't want to have to go into all the stuff. Look, you are or were a sinner, so you know what I'm talking about. Scheming, plotting, thinking, all these things that were in our mind. If they're still in your mind, you probably need to be saved. What does that mean? Delivered by Jesus Christ from the bondage that's inside that's holding you hostage. So I would suggest that maybe you really pay attention to this because it could be your moment where Jesus guides you into peace. Verse 80 it says, So the child grew and became strong in spirit, It was in the desert till the days he manifested to Israel. So it says the child, Jesus, became strong. So God spawned or impregnated Mary. And it says in Matthew chapter 1, it says that in her was conceived. So conception, my wife and I, we conceived children. And our children were conceived. That means I brought my part, she brought her part. And the two were brought together to create one new person, right? And so it means that in her, Matthew chapter 1, was conceived a child. That means God brought his part. Humanity through Mary brought her part. Man and God came into a union together, and that person is called Jesus Christ. Isn't that exciting? So the reason Jesus is so special is because he is now qualified to do something on your behalf being a man, and he's also qualified to represent God being a son of his. So he had this extraordinary position and powerful situation to work with. And so what I love about Jesus is that he didn't come to serve himself. He came to serve the world. So that ought to tell you something about the DNA of God, the nature of God. The love of God. Remember when they threw the woman caught in the act of adultery before Jesus had said, what do you say? You should be stoned according to the law. Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So the Father is not looking to destroy people because of their sins. Did you get that? He is not trying to destroy people because of their sins. He has come mercifully to deliver you from it, not to judge you in it. God is merciful towards us. And he wants to help us. I suggest you run for him. There's hope in no other name but the name Jesus. Because God authored him. So it says the child grew and became strong. That means the child was not strong. And you say, why are you saying that? Because we have a mythical idea about Jesus that's not true. He didn't just go, bink, as a baby, go, Mom, if you just use a different kind of shampoo, my hair would look better. <laughs> yeah. he, he wasn't filled with wisdom at birth. He wasn't special at birth, other than the fact he was born of God. It even says in Isaiah that he wasn't even good looking. 
man, this choir was good looking. I was, I was looking up there that you guys are so, look so nice. But Jesus wasn't good looking. If he stood next to you, you wouldn't go, oh man, you're nice to look at. You wouldn't even think of him that way. He didn't have the advantage of good looks or some stature or something that would attract you to him. And it was by design. God didn't want people in the flesh to be attracted to him. They would have to hear his word and see the manifestation of his nature in life. And they would follow that. We shouldn't be overly impressed with people, with superstars, or with people who've acquired great things, or even preachers who stand in front of great audiences. It is not about the flesh. It is about the character and the nature of God inside. If, if you find that in a person, you could follow that. That's worth following. Can you turn to um, John chapter 5? Um, you can look in your phone. I say turn because I'm an old preacher. I always say turn, and the kids are thinking, swipe. <laughs> swipe. Could you swipe to John chapter 5? <laughs> uh, John chapter 5. There, there's, scripture, there's so many scriptures that reveal um, so many things. This one is particularly, oh, I just love how it says it. It says, um, John chapter 5, verse 17, it says, But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews saw all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he said that God was his father, making him equal with God. Okay, so if you have a son and he calls you father, your son is equal with you, not in authority, in nature. That which comes from you is you. That's why family is so important. Because that is us and your spouse in union which created this new child. How am I going to deny myself in my children? I cannot do it. So we all look for our own image. I met someone here today and says, oh, I could see your son. Oh, yeah, right here, mom. Uh-huh. I saw Dan's mom here, and I said, I can see Dan in your face a little bit. And so we can see our image in our children, and God's image was in Christ. And God, uh, and Jesus called God his father, saying, which the Jews knew, if you say I'm your father, that you make yourself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. This is what our society needs today. It needs fathers to step back up so the son can know what to do. You can liberate all the women in the earth, but if you don't have men that can lead, this is a disastrous society. Well, I didn't get much amens on that one. The skyscrapers were built by men. The bridges were built by men. The roads were built by men. Men built everything. Women didn't build it. Women want equality. They want the office job. They don't want the ditch. Digging the ditch. When I go past the cars broke down, there's a man under the car. And the woman's in the seat because they ain't warm. That's because that's the way God created it. Even a feminist sits in the car and gets a guy on the phone to come and fix her car. It's because we are different. I got hair growing out of my face. Someone says to me, Pastor Chris, why are you growing a beard? I'm not. I stopped shaving. God is growing a beard. <laughs> you understand? We're different. Men are stronger, faster, quicker. Women are smarter, brighter. <laughs> you understand? There's differences. Men's memories are short because they got to get things done. Women can remember it all. <laughs> so you got to know, we are entirely different. I don't know why I said all that. <laughs> John chapter 5. So he says, my father has been working. And he says, they said you make yourself equal with God. I want you to know the word father in the original language, the Greek language, is the word pater. P-A-T-E-R. Pater. What a word. Listen to what it means. It does, doesn't mean father. This is what it actually means. Nearest ancestor, originator of a family, or a company of persons 
animated by the same spirit. Whoa. Did you hear it? Did you hear it? A company of persons who are animated by the same spirit. That's us. Jesus said, God is my pater. He's my nearest ancestor. And he made himself equal with God because he was his nearest ancestor. That is a phenomenal statement. So John chapter 20, please, if you can swipe to 20. I've never said the swipe thing before. John chapter 20, verse 17. This is very interesting as well. Jesus then said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my pater, my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and my father, my nearest relative, the originator of our family, and to my God and to your God, to my father and to your father. Did you get it? Jesus said, go tell the disciples, I'm ascending to my father, my pater, the origin of our family. And he is my father, and he is your father. See, what I don't like about the incorrect glorification of Jesus Christ, if you can say that, is it leaves you out of the equation. Jesus said, you will be glorified together with me. You will be glorified. How? When you become a son of God through the new birth, then he's your father the same as he's Jesus' father, and he's your God the same as he's Jesus' God. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 2, he's not ashamed. He's not ashamed. Can everybody say he's not ashamed? Not ashamed. To call me. call me. Come on, do it again. He's not ashamed, not ashamed. to call me, call me. His, brother. his brother. we got to preach this more. This is a lost message in the body of Christ. If you ask the question across the world, is Jesus our brother? Most people say, no, he's our Lord. Well, he is our Lord. But he's also our brother. How can he be our brother and be our father? No, Father God is our God. Jesus is our brother. Jesus is a son of God, and we've been born of God, and therefore we're the son of God. He says, I'm going back to Peter, the origin of our family. And he's your Peter because he's my Peter. Can you say Peter? That's a funny word. <laughs> Do you know a lot of sci-fi movies and a lot of um, documentary or not documentaries, but movies that are made, they use a lot of biblical language, like AI. You know, all the stuff's in the Bible. You know, there's so many words. Morpheus. You go find. I, I like looking at um, when, when you look at some of these movies, man, you can find all the words in the Old Testament. They're like all over the place. Someone's reading the Old Testament and go, oh, that's a good word. That's, I'll use that. I'll use that. I'll use that. The Bible is the answer to life. And those who find the wisdom of it and honor God in it find life. And they escape the corruption that's in this world. It really is true. Super true. So God is our Father. Can you say God is my Father? Oh, so John chapter 20 is true. He ascended, and he said, he's my father, and he's your father. First Peter, if we can go there quickly. Older people, can you turn your page? <laughs> First Peter, chapter 1. Uh, youngsters are already there. They swiped long ago. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father, Peter, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that Jesus has a Peter? <laughs> that sounds like a movie <laughs> or some kind of joke. <laughs> Blessed be the God Father or Pater of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means the origin of his new family line. Jesus is the product of man and God. Can you say man and God? If you don't have man, you don't have Jesus. You don't have God, you don't have Jesus. He's the union of the two. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercies has begotten us again. 
Now, in the Greek, this is interesting. This begotten us again. This is the word in the Greek, A-N-A-G-E-N-A-O, uh, emphasis on the O. It is from the word genos. I think you recognize that. Genos. Now, in the Wikipedia, genos or gene is race, family, generation. Okay? So this is what it literally, if you want to go a little deeper into the detail of how that happens, how do we become family, how are you brothers, how are you sisters, how is your parents related to you, this is how. DNA is, the, is responsible for the building and maintaining of your human structure. Genes are the segments of your DNA which, <laughs> can't read my own writing, which gives you physical characteristics that make you unique. I'm going to say that again. DNA is responsible for the building and maintaining of your human structure. Genes are the segments of your DNA, which gives you physical characteristics that make you unique. So Jesus is saying here, in the word through Peter, he's saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the abundant mercies, who has given you unique characteristics from heaven, that make you uniquely his children. Now, it's all hidden there. You read in the translation, and you don't even get the depth of what it's talking about. That's why I say we have to get saved and come to the knowledge of God. I need to realize that I'm not a mistake, and I'm not a sinner. In the beginning, before I was born, before I was in my mother's womb, it says in Jeremiah, he knew me before then. I came into this world, and I was devoid of understanding. No one taught me. I didn't understand. So I entered into a life of sin and submitted to a spirit of darkness, and pretty soon I became corrupt inside like every other person. I was marked with tragedy. But God, my Father, didn't want to leave me in that condition, and he sent a person called Jesus Christ in the flesh. Humanity and man joined together to do what? Save the rest of his children from their sins. God is amazing. He don't leave us in this condition. He sent us a message called sonship. God did something about your problem. And then Jesus, as if he needed to die for sin, because the Bible says he never sinned once. He never violated the will of God at all. That means he was unworthy for death. In fact, the Bible says you could not kill him. It's impossible to kill an innocent man. But he willingly gave it up. For what? You. It's 11, 11. He willingly gave it up for you. He willingly, can you say he willingly gave it for me? So the next time you feel condemnation, it's like, oh, Holy Spirit, I know you're convicting me of sin. That's rubbish. The Holy Spirit does not convict the sin. It says in, in John chapter 14, it says, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Spirit will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because you don't believe. He's not convicting you of what you're doing wrong. He's convicting you to believe. believe. Believe what? The report of God that he sent Christ to die on the cross to remove your sins. And when you believe that, when you're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit to believe, you are saved by what? The Spirit of God. And of sin, because you don't believe, of judge, oh, excuse me, of righteousness, because I go to the Father. What did Jesus do when he went to the Father? It says he carried his own blood into the true tabernacle, not the one on the earth in Jerusalem, and put it on the mercy seat. And therefore, having obtained, can you say obtained? Amen. Eternal redemption for us all. Amen. Having obtained eternal redemption for us all, sat down at the right hand of God's power, ever living to intervene on our behalf. Wow. And we say, I feel convicted by the Holy Spirit. What? To believe? Go ahead. <laughs> no, I did something wrong. No, that's the devil convicting you of wrong. It's actually the devil convicting people of sin. Sins. 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 Plural. The devil convicts people of sin. You're bad. You're no good. You're not good enough. You're not as good as God. But the Spirit comes, dwells inside of us to convince us, convict us of what? The fact that God succeeded through Christ to deliver our spirit from bondage because he is the deliverer, the Savior of the world. He came into this world to set us free. Can you say he set us free? He set us free. 
Yeah, see, I, I'm telling you, it, as hard as it is to believe, God is better than you think. God is not some egotistical male chauvinist that wants us to come on Sunday and worship him. I used to be one. One day my wife cured that problem. Because I told you, women are smarter than men. <laughs> she came to our room. I heard, Chris, Chris. I was like, I turned around. She's on her knees. She goes, Chris, you're amazing. She was on her knees. You're amazing. You're the most amazing man. There's no one like you in the world. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> and she said a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, she said a trap. <laughs> and I was like, I was looking at her, and she got up, and she goes, it's stupid, isn't it? That why do you do it to God? And walked away. And I stood there. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Could you come back and do that again? <laughs> uh, but I realized the absurdity that the God of the whole universe needs anything from a bunch of wiggly worm people, Christians, who are sinners, to tell him he's good. What the heck's wrong with you, God? You need us, losers, to tell you you're great? <laughs> and I realized it doesn't make sense. So I went on a quest. I was already a preacher when that happened. You can imagine how that influenced me. I never saw my wife the same way again. <laughs> I said, why don't you tell me that again? <laughs> but I, I went on a question. and I started realizing there's nothing in the Bible that feeds God's ego. ego. Nothing. Nothing. He says, remember the woman at the well? And she said, he says, woman, get me a drink of water. And he didn't go, woman, get me a drink. He wasn't a male chauvinist. That's how the translators made it sound because they were chauvinists back in those days. Don't you agree with that? Do you know not long ago there was slavery? Do you know not long ago women were not allowed to vote? Do you know not long ago? Why? Because we've been being delivered out of an oppressive idea, and some of it was religion that brought it. God didn't come to bring us oppressive religion. He came to bring us liberty. liberty. Yeah. That's right. A man who's worth his salt will defend his wife and stand up for her honor and give her latitude and room to be who she is without crimping her. Jesus doesn't crimp us, right? What was I talking about? <laughs> Sorry? The woman, the, the woman at the well. Thank you. There's garbage up here. <laughs> Those kids were amazing. All right, so the woman at the well, he goes, woman, get me some water. He was tired and thirsty. He sent his disciples away to get food and water. She goes, who are you? A Jew talking to me, a Samaritan woman. We have no interaction between our, our nations. Woman, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for water, and I would give you living water, and you will never thirst again. He wasn't talking about the water well. He was talking about hunger and the spirit for truth and for life. And she was like, Give me this water, sir. And then he started reading her mail. He goes, go get your husband. She goes, I don't have a husband. He goes, you're right. You've had five, and the one you're with is not your husband. They're living together. He didn't go, now I want you to know it's a violation of the law that you're living together, and you are bad, and the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of that. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, the one you're with is not your husband. She goes, I perceive that you're a prophet. He knew stuff about her he couldn't know. Isn't it wonderful? He didn't throw bombs on her because she's doing stuff wrong. He knew she needed salvation, and he came to bring it. He says, she goes, I know you Jews worship in Jerusalem, but us Samaritans, we worship on this mountain. He says, I tell you the truth. you got to hear this. Come on. God's not a chauvinist. God's not an egotistical maniac. He says, I tell you the truth. Jesus said, for my Father is seeking such who will worship him. 
not in Jerusalem, nor on this mountain, but those who will know him in spirit and truth, that they might know him. See, God knows that when you know him for what he is, you will fall in love with him, you will honor him, and you will worship him for what he is. He doesn't want you to vainly say things you don't believe. He wants to grip your heart with his powerful provision and salvation and love for you to rescue you and save you. And then you say, thank you, God, for saving me. I was a wreck, and you gave me a new heart and a new mind to know and to love you. See, praise is spontaneous. It comes from the heart that's been rescued. God could care less if the heathens of this world say, you're a great God and powerful, mighty God, cause it to rain. That's just man. He wants truth and genuine, heartfelt relationship. Somebody help me. Is God good? Last couple thoughts. God is good. So, you know, the birth of Jesus, it had said there in Luke chapter 2. It's interesting how uh, the Bible in the Old Testament and in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John foreshadows spiritual things and tells you in natural ways there, but spiritual for us here. Um, <clears throat> so, Jesus is born, and now Father God, who caused Jesus to be conceived and born through Mary, has now got a kid with humanity. And he's proud. What I did when, when Eve was born, I go, well, this is my daughter. My daughter's born. I was like, I was nutty. Prior to that, I was selfish. All of a sudden, this came from us. And I mean, I'd come home from work, put her on my chest, wake her out of the crib. Marge goes, don't wake her up. Yes. Hi. We'd sit there and doodle and play. And there she is now. <laughs> but it's like, I was so excited. I was an ignorant young man, didn't know much, but all of a sudden I saw my image and likeness and it transformed an idea inside of me and I started to love that person. God loves you. God loves you. I want you to know he's interested in you. He saw you before the foundations of the world. My brain is running all over the place. <laughs> God is good. He'll help me. <laughs> Sorry? There's a lot to be said. It's so good. The news is so good. So when she was born, I wanted to go out and tell everybody, well, what do you think God did? God was the father of Jesus. I have to make an announcement. So who do you think he'd go to? The palace, to the kings, to the lords, to the rulers? No. Shepherds. Farmers. Sheep herders. It's because God knows he has entrusted the good news to shepherds and pastors of the sheep. And so he goes to the shepherds by the Spirit, and the angels appear in the field. And they're like, Ooh. and the angel said, it says, trumpet sounded. We saw them today. <laughs> and he said, do, 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 do. <laughs> said great news it could have said look out you sinners the spirit's coming into the world you're going to feel really convicted about what you're doing wrong no he's coming to save not to <laughs> condemn Jesus said I have not come into the world condemn the world but I have come into the world that it might be saved right. we got the gospel backwards we got to get it back around this way right and so uh, they, they did the announcement and they said, great news, for unto you, pastors, a child is born. What child? Humanity and God have had the kid together. And his name is called Jesus the Christ, the seed of God. Wow. The seed of God. I want you to know. The mission of every fivefold minister, the mission of every minister of any kind, the mission of every pastor is to announce the good news that God did something about your mess. And if you would just learn how to receive it 
and understand that God is not an arrogant, mean, egotistical God who wants you to obey him. In fact, I don't want to get into it, but God doesn't even want you to obey him. Obedience was under the law, under the old covenant. Obedience in the new covenant is a different word, and it means to hear him accurately and to conform your life to him. God doesn't want you to just conform your life. He wants you to hear him. He wants you to understand him. He wants you to know him. Because light has come to people in darkness. Light, what do you mean? It's a metaphor. People who are sitting in darkness or ignorance about God, truth and understanding came to them about God's true heart, that he's a father and he cares about you and he wants to rescue you and he wants to give you a new nature and a new life through Jesus Christ. Yeah, I love, I'm not even going to read that scripture. I, I love that scripture in Galatians chapter 4. Because you are sons. Because you are. You know, if you've come to Christ, you're now a son of God. Jesus is now the eldest brother among many brothers. It's amazing. You can, Hebrews chapter 2, you can read it. And it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, because you are sons, God has sent forth. His, the Spirit, can you say the Spirit? The Spirit of His Son into our hearts. You know, I'm not what I used to be. When you receive Christ, you won't be what you used to be. The worst thing you could ever do trying to get to God is try to be good. That's the worst thing you could ever do. It's not a behavior modification program. This is not the 10 steps of man. This is about opening your heart to the originator of your life who's trying to redeem it back to his original purpose. And as you recognize it and realize it, and the Holy Spirit's bringing conviction to you right now to believe, you can say yes to God. You can say yes to God. And he will put the spirit of his son Jesus in your heart. And now it says you will cry, Abba, 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 Father, Abba, Pater. Origin of my family, my nearest ancestor, God. See, if you don't see it right, you'll make works out of benefits. Maybe someone should write that down. <laughs> You'll make works out of benefits. Do you know, this morning I woke up. I had a headache last night. I didn't know I was asleep. But the headache was causing me to toil in my sleep. The dreams were harsh. They were hard. I was like, rush. like I got to get out of this bed. <laughs> and I finally woke up and got up. Like, what was that? It was horrible. And I didn't really, like, feel spiritual. I needed Margie to get up and start doing her thing, you know, worshiping. And No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. And uh, so I got up. I went out and put the coffee on. And I went in my office to pray. I said, I'm not going to say one religious prayer to you. You're in my pores. There's nowhere I can go that you're not there. I don't want you to give me a love for the world. The love for the world that's in me is from you. I just started talking to him according to truth. I am what you made me to be. I'll never not be what you made me to be. And you're not unrighteous to forget my works of service and my diligence to help the saints of God, and your reward is sure. I just started saying this stuff to him. I don't have my righteousness anymore. I have yours. You made me new. I know what I was, and you know what I was. But I'm not that anymore. I won't steal. I won't covet. I won't commit adultery. I will not do anything that the Ten Commandments say. I'll tell you why. Because I've been changed by the power of God, by the new birth, to see what the law asked me to do and that it was weak through the flesh and I could not do. God sent his son into my heart to cause me to be able to perform what was otherwise impossible. And the law is, is applauding me. That's great, Chris. You don't steal anymore. That's great. The law applauds the life of a believer. 
Are you still a thief? Are you still an adulterer? Are you still a fornicator? Are you still have false gods? Do you still have idolatry? Do you still have all the junk in your life? The Spirit of God is not going to convict you about it. But the Spirit of God will cause you to believe. He'll rise up in you and say, this is the truth of my word. This is what I want for you. I'm calling you home. Come home. Come home. Come home. Come home. Every time you go to a Christmas celebration, you ought to realize all of it is about God sending you his come home message. That's what it's about. Are you son of God? Then now you know what your message is. Your message is the Father. It's the Father. Don't complicate it. Jesus means Son of the Father. I, I'm not talking about definition of the Bible. I'm talking about just in life. He says, I can't do anything unless the Father shows me. A son can do nothing unless his Father teaches him. You ought to get that, fathers. You ought to hear, hear that. You don't go to church, he won't go to church. You don't love God, he probably won't love God. There's alcoholism in our family. We can't seem to break the problem. God's calling you home. You got, don't say, I got to change and I got to get better. I got to stop drinking. No, actually, have a drink and go to church. <laughs> In fact, tell the devil, I'm going to have this drink and go to church. You say, Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying you can't deliver yourself by trying. You got to bow your knee. You got, that means you surrender my natural existence, my natural futility, my natural trying to get better. I surrender and I fall on my knees before God. It's like, God, bring me back to my original design. Bring me back to what you promised in Christ. I know what he did for me. And then God's spirit will come into your heart and change you. And the need for that will diminish and leave you. I don't need coffee. I don't need wine. I need food. I need liquid. But I don't need any particular one. I can graze. <laughs> you understand. He liberates us. Can you say he liberates us? Can you stand, please? Okay, I'm going to help you uh, because the Father is gracious to you. And he's not trying to call you out. He's not trying to make you a difficulty. Um, sometimes people will say, well, if you pray this prayer, then you're saved. And that's not true. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, then you're saved. If you don't believe in your heart and you confess a prayer, it doesn't help you. So look, there's, there's something alive in you right now. It's the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to his word. That's the spirit of God. That's your father, your pater, the one who wants you to come back into the family line. He wants you to be born again. He wants you to be rebirthed. He wants you to be born from above. He wants his genos at work in you to create a unique characteristics of him in you. He wants to see himself in you again. This is how you can say, Dad, I'm coming home. That's how it is. It's not hard. It's when your heart says yes to God and you say, God, I need you. I need you. I need you. I don't need anything more than you. The best present you'll ever get in your life is the salvation that your Father offers you. There's no greater salvation. There's no greater plan. There's nothing. Religion will never satisfy you. In fact, people are leaving religion by the droves. They're saying, Christianity in the world today is declining. No, they're talking about religion. Christianity is inclining like mad in China, in Asia, in, in South America, everywhere in America. The true faith is on the rise. Religion is in a massive decline. Have you been stuck in religion? Have you been stuck in plastic religion, I should say? The fake stuff. Well, today's your day. You can get out. This is how. You can invite the Father to birth his spirit inside you. I'm asking you to close your eyes. I'm not calling anybody out, so don't fear. I, I don't want to make one bit complicated the simplicity of this thing. If you can just relate to God this way, just say, God, I hear your message. Maybe for the first time I understand. You can pray this right to him, and just under your breath, you can just say it in your heart. I understand this for the first time. I, I see you sent Jesus to join yourself to humanity so you could restore all people back into fellowship with you. I want 
my sins forgiven. I want to escape this wicked plot against me. I want to come home. I want you as my father. And I want you to build your image in me. I, I want that. I want to become like Jesus in my life, not trying to be. I want it to be a manifestation of his nature in me. So I invite you. I invite the spirit of Jesus Christ. Just say to him, I invite the spirit of Jesus Christ to come into my life. I invite you. Have your way inside of me. Make me new. Cleanse me. Cut away the filth of my heart and make me a brand new man. Cause the new birth. Cause your genos, your seed to be released inside of me to produce your nature and your image inside of me so that I will grow in you and become more and more and more like my father in this life. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done to make this so easy for me. Thank you for doing the heavy lifting. Maybe you should thank Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus, for what you did. You, you, you paid it. You suffered it. You did it. On our behalf, as our eldest brother, you have taken this curse out of the way so that we can just believe and come into it. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Maybe in your own heart you could just thank him in your own words and Thank you for my new salvation. Thank you for this beginning, this new beginning. Thank you for giving me this special day that I can start to walk with you in a new life. Lead me forward from this place. Help me to stay connected to the body of Christ and to the shepherds who lead the sheep into victory. Thank you for the salvation that's so freely given to me. Amen. You're